Well, welcome back, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Mick Breggy on behalf of Startup Nation, and here I'm here at the studio today. I'm also the host of FutureCast, which is an upcoming show featuring a forecast of innovative new ideas from different diverse perspectives designed to make an impact on everyday life. So I'm super excited about our guest today, and it's a very interesting topic. Uh, Gary Radburn has been at the forefront of tech innovation for 30 years. But before we intro, I just want to remind everyone that we're going to, going to be answering uh, comments at the end in chat after the talk. So make sure you've entered those in, and we'll be addressing those in the tail end if we have time today. So definitely leave those there. Um, also make sure you've entered the Ultimate Work From Home Bundle, a $3,500 value which has everything you need to stay productive and efficient for wherever work, work takes you from Dell. So definitely check that out. I believe we're still uh, having entries throughout the end of the day today, so definitely get your name in. So anyway, back to our talk. Gary Radburn is the director of VR and AR and client virtualization globally at Dell Inc., managing the team that charged with developing and delivering VR AR technology and working closely with Dell customers on VR AR deployments around the world. He has worked with, for companies such as Digital Equipment, 3Com, and for the past 18 years, Dell. With the fast adoption of VR and AR solutions and remoting, Gary has taken the helm for driving these exciting new areas of business. So that's the bio, but I am so excited to talk to you today, uh, especially, you know, I think these technologies uh, have so much potential for the largest impact area, especially in difficult times. Um, so Gary, thank you so much for being on. Thanks for having me, it's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Is there anything else you want to add before we begin? Uh, no, I mean, the, uh, the intro makes me sound incredibly interesting, so hopefully I'll be able to live <laughs> up to the hype. Yeah, we'll keep things <laughs> interesting today. Um, so first and foremost, I think it's important too, and this is something that we had talked about beforehand that is absolutely crucial to nail, is getting terminology straight. Um, so defining VR, AR, depending on the use case. So for those who are not familiar, who may be tuning in, uh, what's the difference between AR and VR, and what do those terms even mean? Just base level. Oh, okay. So basically, the the VR and the AR. I always like to start off by making sure that everyone's on the same page because when we talk VR, when we talk AR, then if you've got a different expectation or a different belief on what it actually is, then you tend to go off kilter in the wrong direction. So virtual reality is when I'm going to have complete control of what you see and what you hear. So you're going to be immersed inside of a, a headset, it's gonna be an immersive reality inside of there, I control what you see, I control what you hear inside of there, and you're not gonna be distracted by the outside world. So if I was doing something and I was watching a video or uh, something of that ilk, then I can actually walk off, I can go and get a cup of tea, I can mm. go and do an email or things like that. Virtual reality is now where I have you actually inside of a headset. I if I don't hold your attention inside of there, then I'm obviously doing something wrong uh, because I'm not being that engaging. And that's going to be all computer generated. Now, inside of VR, there's things we call degrees of freedom. There's a three degrees of freedom, and then there's six degrees of freedom. Six degrees is what we really aim for, because that's going to give you the best experience, because that means you can go up, down, left and right, pitch, roll and yaw. And if I'm walking around inside of a safe space, I can actually walk within the environment that I am in within inside of VR. OK, so if I walk closer to something, then that thing will actually become closer. Uh, that's a different thing from 360 video which is the precursor there. Uh, it's like VR light, as it were. You're still immersed inside of that environment, but you're in a single point of space. So if I walk forwards, everything is moving with me inside of that video. VR, I'm now inside that immersive environment. With AR, I'm now overlaying graphics inside of the real world. I'm augmenting that reality with objects, with uh, labels, with devices, and that really opens up a whole new slew of possibilities. Uh, I mean, most AR presentations can't go without mentioning Pokemon Go, and it looks like I just did. Mm. <laughs> uh, so that really brought AR to the forefront of people thinking about what's really possible, even on a simple device such as a phone. Now, if we take that into a work context, we can now do things like assisted learning. We can actually have things where we can overlay graphics, and we'll talk about some of that later on. 
but we can actually have things that really help us in our day-to-day -day work without being too intrusive. Uh, we can take it simply like heads-up displays um, from pilots uh, in the military or whatever that are already using technology like that, and bringing that again into real-world society. So we're now looking at the real world, but augmented with graphics. Great. And, and now that we've kind of set that baseline tone, how have you seen AR and VR use cases vary industry to industry? Well, that's, that's a very strange question to answer because it varies and it doesn't vary. Mm -hmm. um, in the fact that there's a common thread that goes through every type of industry. Uh, we, I deal what we call cross-vertical. And by vertical, I would take something like media entertainment, I would take automotive, I would take healthcare. Uh, all those different verticals, as we call it, are different industries with different needs and wants. They all have a different workflow that they're trying to work to inside of it. They have different deliverables. However, the common theme, especially in the situation we find ourselves in today, is how do I train people effectively? And training, whether you've got the traditional method when we're all in an office and we're all in a classroom and we get taught there through audio visual presentation. Uh, that was one way of training people up. Uh, on the job training, so vocational training with somebody that you go out with who's a veteran, who will then show you the ropes as it were to, to bring you through. That's another way of training. Uh, however, inside of the more isolated areas that we are now, how can we really develop some training that's meaningful and can really bring people together. And that's where we're starting to see VR really being used. Um, there's an interesting statistic, which I, which I throw out there. And uh, I try not to do it too often because it makes my life seem completely futile. Uh, because when you're learning through audio visual, right, rather like watching a presentation where I'm standing up, waxing lyrical about stuff, uh, then you take in about 10 to 20% of what's actually being presented. Uh, and that 10 to 20% is probably me saying, do you know you actually take in 10 to 20%? Mm. I, I don't want you to just take away that one fact. I want you to take away more. VR will actually give you up to about 75% retention rate of the information because it's immersive. You're involved in the situation. You can train up things like muscle memory. So you can actually do repetitive actions. You can do expensive environments like clean rooms or areas uh, or in automotive, which is a, a big thing around the Detroit area, where you could actually service a car or manufacture a car. Are you going to let somebody in there who's holding very expensive parts to then try and fit that to a vehicle in the real world? Or would you rather train them up initially to show them the ropes, as it were, by training them inside a virtual simulation of that so they can actually recognize objects, know how to manipulate objects, and they operate as they would do in the real world, but you don't have that expense of setting all of that up in the first place. And I find that really goes across vertical to vertical to vertical about the training aspects. Right. So if we're talking specifically, you know, the 75% retention rate on the enterprise vertical, and you're seeing these massive benefits from being able to potentially train an employee to do something that's incredibly complicated in a virtual space, um, what might be some other benefits for using AR or VR in a business landscape? Well, the, the other benefits besides the cost I've made, you've also got safety. Uh, if you're doing hazardous environments, uh, say oil rig or whatever else, or uh, we've actually seen firefighters using it as well uh, for how do you actually attack a fire? Where do you put the hose? You see all of this inside a virtual environment. How would you do a smoke filled room uh, without actually you know, putting somebody into that environment? Uh, we can simulate all of those things along there. So we're really seeing that starting to take off in, in that respect. When we touch on the AR side, then the assisted learning again is, is key. It's almost like having, uh, what's the best way of putting it? A video, a video conversation that's overlaid on your vision that's actually gonna point things out to you. And we've actually done a simulation with IoT, you know, the internet of things, uh, with sensors and a bit of computer vision. So to actually recognize a sensor and then to overlay information about that sensor in real time. So I don't have to stick a probe onto it or anything like that. I can just look at that through uh, the AR glasses 
it will then recognize the object I'm looking at. It's then connected at the back end to the sensor database where all the information is being collected, and then overlay in real time information about that scenario. And uh, we did that with, um, Oh, the name escapes me now. Um, but it's, it's, you know, when you start something, you think, oh, right, I should have thought about that before. Yeah. Um, but we actually did that with um, growing crops. Right? So growing crops in not a field type environment, but growing them in a very large building and then being able to monitor the nutrients and the growth rates and then what the expected growth rate is going to look like just by looking at that particular plant. So you actually see how is that going to grow given the current situation with uh, oxygen levels, food levels, and whatever that's coming into it, and is that going to be the optimum growth for that particular plant? So again, that's an AR type scenario. Making it a little bit more real to today and everyday use, then a particular use case that I'm quite excited by is when we start getting into uh, automotive vehicles, self-driving, you can have things that are overlaid there. But even on a personal level, you, know, you go to a university campus for the first time. You go to a museum or a place of interest. Uh, I haven't actually been myself. It's on, it's on my list of things to do. Uh, but things like the Smithsonian, which are absolutely huge. Imagine if you could go in there and be wearing a set of glasses, and then all of a sudden directions are overlaid onto the floor in front of you. You're going to your next lesson, and you're a, a freshman at the campus. How are you going to get to your next class? Imagine if you now had directions which were given to you in real time, uh, almost like a GPS navigation system, and you're now getting that at a campus level inside of there, to really drive you to, well, not drive, but actually enable you to walk to your next lesson inside of that campus without actually really even knowing where you were or looking like a, a freshman by carrying a map around. <laughs> exactly. That's a, <laughs> the best use case for freshmen in college going into, uh, yeah, uh, trying to find their classes. So, you know, <laughs> something that I, that I was thinking about, too, is you mentioned the Smithsonian and kind of using these historical examples as context for what you can do in AR is the idea that there's this extra layer of information, but extra layer of reality, like in actually augmenting some sort of additional reality onto your field of view. So looking at history in the context of, here is something in a historical time period, and then everything around you kind of transforming into that, uh, that period of time or giving you information about that, that uh, what it was like to be in that time period, in that scenario. Is that too far-fetched, or is that kind of in the trajectory of where things are heading? Uh, what if I was to say that's already here? Mm. Um, so if we take that in the context of VR, uh, so we've worked very closely with Sony Innovation Studios who are doing a lot of volumetric capture. Uh, volumetric capture being, I mentioned the VR environment as being completely computer controlled, but there's different ways that you can actually create an environment in the first place. You can make it look obviously computer generated, and anybody who's played video games or whatever else will know that when you're playing the latest shoot 'em up or first person or whatever else, then if it looks like a wall, that's okay. It's a wall. I, I get the idea. That's not the important part. The important part then is frames per second and your interaction with the game. When you now start to capture real environments, you can actually go to a new level of detail. And that's where you can start to scan things in in point clouds where I'm getting like sub-millimeter accuracy, scanning the environment, and then being able to digitize all of that, condense it down, and then being able to have a real environment that I can actually walk through inside of VR. Now, why is that important? Let's think about some recent world events that you know, happened uh, last year, year before, things like that. There's um, the burning down of, uh, of Notre Dame right, in France. Notre Dame Cathedral, fantastic place. Uh, huge amounts of historical interest. And if we'd managed to digitize that before the fires broke out to preserve its glory, then even if buildings disappear, we can still have uh, the youth coming through and generation after generation still being able to appreciate and see the architecture that's happened before, even if those buildings don't exist, as if you're really being there. Uh, we've also got things where uh, there was a fire in a Brazilian museum destroying a load of artifacts. Imagine now digitizing all of those uh, artifacts in volumetric capture 
or even photogrammetry, you know, just taking the outside of it and preserving that so I can look around it inside of 3D. And then taking those into museums and exhibits, I can then be wandering around and then the object will pop up in front of me, even though the object isn't physically there. Or if pieces of the object are actually missing because they've deteriorated over time, I could then have AR augment it as it was supposed to be seen back in the day. Mm. And those sorts of educational tools and using those for remote field trips for students or whatever else, but without having to travel the world. Traveling the world is obviously problematic. Hopefully I, it's all gonna finish when it finishes, but you know, until then, we can then still travel to other places. We can still go and see things that we wouldn't be able to see because of not being able to travel. And that has huge benefits. And that's something we're very keen on doing is extending the reach or, or let's call it shrinking the world, mm. shrinking the world so other people can actually experience things who perhaps might not have been able to afford it, haven't got the facility to be able to do it, or themselves live in remote locations and can't actually get there. Right. So do you believe that there are two separate timelines, one for enterprise and one from a consumer perspective of when I'm going to be able to buy for my day to day, something like an AR heads up display, being able to wear it around and experience some of the things that you're talking about versus when a business is going to be able to actually implement this onto into their uh, field or industry. So if they if a business who's watching this hasn't integrated integrated AR and VR yet at this point, what are some of the ways that they could start or, you know, from a ground level, begin looking into some of these solutions? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. The, the consumers always seem to start things first. Where, where VR and AR really grew up was all of the work that was being done inside of the media and entertainment industry. So effectively, gaming started to drive the VR industry. You had products such as Oculus that came out. They, they really started to lead the trend. Uh, inside of that, from a consumer point of view, you had the three DOF headset, the Oculus Go. Um, that was actually adopted by some in industry for training up their sales folks and their store staff. Uh, imagine using that to show somebody a Black Friday type environment. You know, people uh, apparently in the US, you know, you could, you can tell that perhaps from my accent, I'm not originally from the US. Um, but apparently in the US, Big Fr Black Friday is a big thing because people want their bargains, they want to go in there, and there's door busters and whatever else happened. So how do you train your staff to be able to react in that environment without potentially putting them in hazards by putting them directly into a, a Black Friday situation? So... The Oculus Go was actually used to put people into 360 video environments for training purposes. You know, can you spot um, the person who's in, in danger in aisle three? Can you spot the lost child inside of there? Can you spot the liquid on the floor and whatever else that's a safety hazard? All these types of scenarios in, inside of this really chaotic environment, but we can actually prepare people for it by using VR. So that was right at the, the initial stages of when VR was starting to become popular. Uh, customers then started looking at the follow-on headsets, uh, but HTC, who we partner with um, very closely at Dell, we actually choose, the, choose them as a partner because they had the first enterprise user license agreement. Uh, the enterprise user license agreement, or the EULA uh, as abbreviated, is that thing that everybody just hits yes right at the start. Uh, however, it is quite important in a business context because you need to know that you're, if you're using it to promote your business, if you're using it to train your staff, if you're using it as a necessary function inside of design right, for your engineers or whatever else, then you need to know that that equipment is being supported in the same way that all of your other enterprise infrastructure is also being supported. So your workstations, for instance, does it carry the same level of support as your workstation. Because if you're now using VR in enterprise, you connect up your headset to your workstation, and if your workstation breaks, it's fixed with within a couple of hours, but then your headset breaks, and you have to put it in a box, you have to get a returns label, you have to then send it off, you have to wait for them to evaluate whether it's actually faulty or not, then they send a replacement back. That's downtime. And in enterprise, downtime is money. So you need to make sure that your enterprise user license agreement covers you for using that headset inside of an enterprise environment. 
The other thing is privacy in terms of consumers. So consumers, again, hit that license agreement and say, yes, your data is being collected, telemetry data is being sent back, uh, other information is being gathered and sent back to you know, the, the host company uh, who provided the headset. If you're an enterprise, you also need to make sure that your privacy is also being preserved because you don't want all of the information that's private and confidential to your organization going outside of your four walls. So you need to make sure that everything is above board for your use. And so with HTC, we've uh, got a good range of products there we find that are being used in enterprise, all the way through from eye tracking, submillimeter, uh, lighthouse type headsets, um, which are used for very intricate work, all the way through to inside out tracking with the Cosmos, to wireless with a Focus Plus. And all of those give you different advantages uh, as you've seen in the consumer space to the enterprise. If you don't have a lot of room, then you don't want to put lighthouses up if you haven't got dedicated space to put a VR setup. Not everybody is lucky enough to have that amount of space to do that. So you pick the headset that actually suits your needs. And as I say, we have that range, which we think covers off all the use models for enterprise inside of that. But if you're looking to deploy it now, then today is the first day of the rest of VR. Yeah, you don't wait to save up money to buy a supercar and then learn how to drive. Right? You learn how to drive as you go along, and then when you've then got to a point where you can afford that supercar, then you buy that, and you've already done the basics. You know how to do it, and hopefully you're not going to wrap it around the nearest lamppost. Hmm. Wow. So there we have, I feel like for enterprise, a few of these, these core points that are being addressed by systems that you're describing. So you have the security taken care of, you have uh, the ability to have uh, your units serviced or within your workstation or your environment uh, on the enterprise level. And you're also defining a number of different use cases that a, a, any sort of business can jump on board with and begin slowly experimenting with until they figure out the uh, best ways, most effective ways that this can continue to uh, benefit their comp company. So um, how can things, uh, these types of solutions, aside from just purely on the enterprise level, talking about co-working, remote working, how does AR and VR tie into that? Uh, again, very good question. And all, all of these, these things seem to have accelerated probably by, yeah, let's, let's call it three to five years. Um, customers were looking at how do they do VR collaboration? How can they get more of that personal connection with other companies outside of theirs? So if you're a company that's take media and entertainment, for instance, a studio works on a film, they have lots of sub studios inside of there. How do you all then work together and come together in that space? Uh, if, again, we take an automotive example, um, inside of automotives, they use things called caves. Uh, it's a visualization environment where people can stand inside of a room and it's projected onto the walls and the ceiling. So you feel like you're inside that space and come together and collaborate. They're looking at VR now as how can you do remote collaboration or remote caves? So rather than flying everybody backwards and forwards for regular check-ins on design, how can we do that in a VR environment and then have the final check or fewer checks uh, done in person? Right? So we're actually maximizing everybody's time. We're actually maximize, sorry, minimizing the travel and entertainment budget right? and making more effective use of our resources by using VR inside of that. So the use models are really starting to grow with those times. And we're starting to see the fruits of that labor coming up. There's more and more tools. I mean, VR has been going now for well, probably since about the 1950s, I think. Probably some, some would argue even before that in Victorian times. Um, but yeah, the first thing you stuck your head into uh, was back in the 1950s. Hmm. Uh, and there's been several iterations of VR as we go up from there. We're, I think we're now at a point where it's affordable, it's usable. The technology is there to be able to drive it effectively. We can use VR without having nausea. Uh, that was a, a key thing. If you don't hit that 90 frames per second or thereabouts, then lizard brain kicks in and then starts to evacuate. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole thing behind that, which I'm not going to go into. But uh, yeah, effectively, it takes us back to the dawn of time uh, when we were foraging for strange foods and then protecting ourselves from ones we shouldn't eat. Uh, so when the stimulus doesn't add up, then 
you know, your, your body reacts to that. And that's essentially what the motion sickness is inside of VR if you don't have the right frame rate. So it's now all come to a point now where it really is the time for VR to grow, to be adopted, and to adapt inside of all these different areas that we've got. And you know, if we've got time, I'd like to touch on the like the healthcare aspects and whatever. So you know, the soundbite alert is not everybody works in healthcare, but everybody cares about their health. And there's been some some great developments inside of that area, which uh, which are interesting for everybody. I think. Yeah, let's break those down further. And I think you know, just to add an additional point to that, I feel like when you talk about virtual co-working, for example, or visualization in that sense. A Zoom call is a different level than being in a, a virtual environment with someone in a, a space where you feel like there's this uh, virtual presence and you actually feel like you can collaborate in a certain way on a whole nother scale from uh, what you would be actually currently able to do with you know jumping on a con kind of conversation like we're having right now. Um, so yep. before you touch on healthcare, Virtual conference, conferences are employee functions. Another huge yeah. thing that I feel like would benefit a majority of businesses. I know I've been in a space where my coworkers and I are in a virtual environment and we feel that tangible connection. We feel like stuff can get done more effectively. So how can businesses use this? It's a good point. Uh, in terms of virtual conferences, uh, we've we've done a few internally and uh, we're looking at how do we actually expand on that and that usage model. When you start getting avatars and things like that involved, so personification of yourself inside a virtual environment, uh, and you start using technology like eye tracking right, inside of headsets, you now translate that into a virtual collaboration or a virtual meeting room inside an environment that might actually be familiar. If, uh, oh, I mentioned photogrammetry and point clouds earlier. Imagine taking a conference room that you know and love right, inside of your office, and you capture that. Now you can actually invite people into the meeting. They've got their own avatars. You're now using eye tracking, so you can actually see where people are looking around in that type of environment. Uh, and you can actually interact with them. You know where they're looking. You know what they're doing. You can have things around the room, so there can be uh, objects that people can pick up, interact with. Uh, you could actually have a conference room table with everybody sitting around it, and then perhaps pull up an object from an engineering tool. Right, and then have that in the middle of the table, and everybody can interact with each other. They can private message, they can public message, they can take notes inside. Um, we're currently looking at a platform from HTC called Sync, S-Y-N-C, and that allows you to dictate notes inside of that. So one of the, the things about VR is that you can't see anything outside. So how would you take notes inside of a meeting? It's a key thing that's a, a barrier to adoption. Inside of here now, I can privately mute my microphone, but it will actually take dictation from myself, translate that speech to text, so I'm now making notes inside of a meeting that I can then call upon later. We can then annotate diagrams. We can annotate objects inside of that 3D space and work together. So I could draw an arrow on, a, on an object and then say, okay, I'm looking at this bit here. What do we think? Can we dissect that? Can we talk about that area? We've got presentation facilities. I can put up a PowerPoint. I can put up a PDF. Uh, I can put up um, a movie even right inside of that. And everybody can actually interact with each other and talk to each other and see where they are. One of the interesting side effects of VR is that in a Zoom call, um, there's been a lot of talk around the Zoom fatigue and you know, lots of objects on the screen, lots of people on the screen, and people getting very tired because of the focus you have to have in Zoom. So it started off with everybody doing videos. Now it's like occasionally people do videos or it's just the video of the, of the speaker and everybody else is just their static photo right inside of that. I now don't know whether somebody's off making a sandwich, walking the dog, or whether I've actually got their attention right, inside of that Zoom meeting. When you're in VR, if somebody's in that meeting, they're obviously wearing a headset. Right? I've now got the attention of that person. If that person takes that headset off, they disappear from the meeting room. So now you know that you haven't got their attention. If they're looking at other things, so let's say, not, not that anybody would ever do this, but let's say they perched it on top of their head so that it actually looked like they were wearing the headset, you would actually see that the headset was always looking up, right? And so therefore they're not actually engaging with the, uh, with the room inside of that VR environment. So it becomes very controllable 
inside of there uh, and gets everybody's focus. And you can actually end up with shorter meetings because everybody has that presence inside of there. So let's oh, uh, Sorry, trade shows as well, you mentioned as well, didn't yes. you? Yes. Yeah. So the other thing about um, trade shows is obviously we're not going to them anymore uh, because with the current situation, that's not possible. So we're actually looking at ways, how do you do virtual conferences, virtual tables, uh, where people can walk around, not necessarily even in a headset. Right, how can you walk around a virtual conference area and then perhaps interact in VR if you want to? You can go and sit down at a presentation. We still have timed presentations, so you still have that sense of urgency uh, because I, I tend to find, I'm not too sure if that's the same with everybody, but I tend to find that unless I actually have, have to go somewhere at a certain prescribed time, uh, then, you know, I will put it off and put it off and I won't actually do it. But if you make some something a timely imperative, then you'll go and do that at a certain time. So you'll get more out of it. The example I give there is, um, and again, it, it does date me and I, I, I hate saying it to a certain point, but it's a very good illustrative example, uh, is that I'll sit down in front of the TV at night after a hard day's work. I'll go and put the TV on. I'll see what's playing. I'll see a particular movie channel and I'll go and say, yep, I'm going to watch that movie. I haven't seen it for ages. And I'll watch it with advertisements all the way through it and whatever. I'll get three quarters of the way through and I'll suddenly go, hang on, I've got this on DVD. Right? And I could have actually watched it a lot quicker right, by watching the DVD and going out and getting that and doing that. But because it's at a prescribed time, I find myself still being a creature of habit and then say, oh, I need to sit down at eight o'clock and I need to watch this all the way through right? rather than watching it in my own timeline. Now, I say that might date me. Other people might be different, but that's that's how I find interacting with conferences is, is better there when you have those time presentations. And then also, if you've got things like uh, the booths and the equipment, you can actually pull up a full 3D exhibit. You can actually rotate it in your hands. You can explode that inside of that. So we're looking at being able to do that, which is what we affectionately in the trade called the petting zoo when we were inside the uh, the trade show. And then also things where you need to talk to a specialist. You've got a particular issue that you want to discuss. We can even set up meeting rooms and meeting times and ad hoc. So somebody could be sitting at their desk doing their day's work and they're on, should we call it booth duty? And they'll suddenly get a ping on their desktop that somebody's at the booth and wants to talk. They can then put on a headset, the avatar comes in. You can then have a virtual conversation with a real person through the medium of VR to discuss your particular issue in private. Hmm. So there, there's some great possibilities. So we've talked about that for conferences, for trade shows. We've talked a little bit about how these type of solutions uh, exist in like an automotive type environment. Let's circle back to what you were starting to say about healthcare, because I feel like that's an, yeah. an absolutely interesting industry and where uh, virtual reality strides are being made. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's absolutely incredible. I, I didn't know what I was getting into when I picked up the reins of, of VR and AR. Uh, I thought it was interesting from a technological standpoint, but having the opportunity now to work in any vertical and across verticals has been an absolute eye-opener of how people work in those environments. And uh, we got involved with uh, the University of uh, Southern California, uh, Dr. Skip Rizzo with his project Brave Mind. And he's doing PTSD, uh, treatments uh, with VR. So rather than doing the usual talk about it and then talk about it and then relive it through talking about what happened during it, uh, the situation can actually be recreated inside of VR. Uh, and then the experience is more vivid inside of it. And they're finding that treatment times become a lot more effective and a lot quicker uh, inside of that. So you're really dealing with the human good Right, in terms of treatments for VR. When you think about people recovering from operations, uh, how do you get that mobility? And you, know, you, could, you could have broken a limb or, or pulled muscles or whatever else. And then the doctor says, okay, you need to do this exercise uh, 10 minutes every two hours right, to ensure mobility and whatever. That becomes very, very tedious. 
right? But if you can gamify that inside of a VR game or an AR game and have people actually reaching out for things inside of that environment so that it just doesn't become prescriptive, but it becomes a fun activity, that again is where you can really start to see the benefits of VR, where people actually forget that it's about treatment and it's actually about getting them moving, but it's actually making it fun to do with a fun activity. And we're seeing lots of different examples of their relaxation techniques, where you can transport uh, people to different locations inside of VR, soothing music, go onto a sandy island in the middle of a blue sea somewhere, and then just relax because we're actually seeing pain management inside of VR. Your pain thresholds actually uh, increase by 15 to 20%, I think it is, uh, from using VR because it's distraction. Uh, and again, I'm reminded of when I was, when I was very, very young uh, and you're going for your first inoculations. Right? And the needle looks like the size of a huge tree. Right? The nurse is charging over at you from the other side of the room, using it like a javelin. Uh, this, is, this, is, this was what was going through my head when I was young. <laughs> I was like, wow, right? this is and a then... traumatic experience for you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then, then at the last second, they say, what's that out the window? And mm. you look out the window and you go, what? And then they jab you with the needle. Mm. But because you're not looking, you don't actually really feel it as much because you're not tense. You're not looking for it. You're not looking for the entry point, And it just takes your mind off of what you were doing. And in much the same way, VR does the same thing for pain management in that style. It becomes that distraction therapy inside of that. And then when we move into AR, we're actually seeing things uh, in, with doctors and surgeons. How do you actually deal with patients? You're normally trained on an MRI scan. Uh, you're trained on a dummy or something like of, of that nature. I imagine now if you can actually take an MRI scan of the patient, not just a patient, but the patient. And now I can scan down through that MRI and I can take layers. And I can plan the operation. I can actually see what I'm going to do. Now, imagine if I can actually practice that on this virtual patient before I even go into the operating theater, right? Before I actually even make the first incision, I've already planned what my route is going into, into that patient itself. Uh, the other thing was I was, and again, you know, if, if somebody's fact checking this, uh, then this is what was told to me. But apparently if you're operated on and they find something else when they're actually inside, then under the regulations, they have to sew you back up again, revive you, and then go and ask for your permission to then go in and do whatever they found inside. Imagine if you actually had that where you could find any potential issues beforehand inside of the virtual operation, before you even make that incision, so that you're covering all of your bases before you actually go into the patient themselves. Again, it's a far better outcome for everybody, uh, and that's what everybody wants, both surgeon and patient. And then we've got situations now with AR where surgeons are actually overlaying um, it's a company called um, Mediviz. And you can overlay an AR picture onto the patient in real time through AR glasses. And you can actually see through those layers in real time on top of the patient itself. So you're seeing their head, for instance, and then taking the layers through without actually making any incisions whatsoever. And then having a, a helper, and I'm sure they've got a more professional name than that, uh, but uh, the, the assistant in the back that's now looking at a screen and can annotate the vision of the surgeon again in real time because they're looking at a different view, they can see different things, and they can actually point things out to the surgeon in real time inside of the operating theater itself. It, it just becomes absolutely fascinating right, inside of this type of environment that VR is not only being used as training tools, as uh, edutainment, uh, but is actually being used for real world good situations. And, and that to me is like awesome. Wow. And just to remind who is listening, these are solutions that are existing right now, currently in place. These are these are not a five year down the line solution. These are things that are, are current technology that we can actually use in, t in these types of environments. So I think that really sets context Correct. to how much we've, involved, we've evolved in the last five or 10 years within this particular area uh, and why it is so important to continue to push forward uh, in different areas and in different industries.
So we've talked about a few different areas specifically, um, but what are we seeing in terms of solutions that entrepreneurs and startups can jump onto? Going to the, the ground foundational level, what are things that they can immediately implement into their landscape while what's most important to them staying cost conscious? Right, so the, the barriers to entry were cost, um, and now the, the barriers have been effectively eroded. We're, we're several generations down the line now in terms of the headsets. Uh, the headsets just kept keep getting more and more functional, better resolution, um, better interaction, better frame rates. Uh, when it all started off and we were all on the mobile phone and using VR then, you know, it was killing the battery. It wasn't really a device that was designed for VR. People said, oh, I've tried VR, but I didn't like it. Or, uh, yeah, Auntie Gladys got sick or screamed or whatever else. We've, we've seen all the videos out there and things like that. And that was the, the start of VR, I think. VR has progressed so far since then. And the cost points have still been gradually reduced as we're going down because obviously as it becomes more and more popular, then scale allows you to you know, shrink things down and make them more cost effective. So anybody now can really get hold of a machine. At Dell, we've actually democratized VR as well. So <clears throat> excuse me, we've lowered the entry point for hardware to drive VR systems. So the price point now has been reduced over the last what three to four years from a couple of thousand dollars now to below the sub 1000 bracket right inside of the us to be able to drive a vr headset in a very effective way that 90 frames per second that i mentioned earlier or whatever the headset sustains as its highest refresh rate now once you've got that hardware what do you then do with it there's several different engines out there. Uh, we've got the Unreal Engine and you've got the uh, Unity Engine. Uh, they're probably the, the predominant ones out there. So if you're already familiar with programming and things like that, then that's a step up. Uh, tools have been created in the last, what, again, three, four years. So as we've had this gradual tick of hardware improving, people haven't been static behind the scenes because it used to take a movie film budget to actually do a VR training experience for an enterprise. Uh, now that's become very, very cost effective uh, with uh, partners like Induvo, where you can actually use it like a drag and drop uh, type environment to create a training experience very, very cost effectively with objects from huge libraries and whatever else that you can then drop in. Or if you wanted to, you can then program your own in an Unreal Engine or Unity, and they've become far more plug and play in terms of what they can do, far easier to use without being an in-depth programmer. Uh, and there's so many utilities and documents and tutorials <coughs> excuse me, that are available out there that we're actually starting to see more and more people dip their toe in the water to create new tools. Uh, and enterprise are always clamoring for VR skills because they're trying to get onto being able to develop things. We, I work very closely with um, a VR studio that's based out of uh, Durham. And we did a project with the city of Durham to engage with local communities uh, for city planning. Um, people think in city planning that people just hate you and they want to build that on the corner because it's a personal thing. It's like, no, there's a whole decision process that goes through. Regentrification of different areas. How is that actually done? How is that planned? And it was a VR experience and it gamified city planning. So you knew why decisions were being made, but it was engaging in terms of the headset experience. And it wasn't designed to teach. It wasn't designed to mandate. It was designed to promote conversation so that people could have an informed conversation about what went into city planning, what was being uh, planned and how they could get involved and how they could actually see what the differences would be given to them by VR rather than going seeing the final building when it's finally built. I could actually see what it was going to look like in that area. And it was huge. So it enabled that social interaction. So you're not looking for the next opus. You're not looking for, you know, what can you do to sell millions of copies of, or well, perhaps you are, I, I don't know you, but, and that might be your prerogative. But companies are really looking for bespoke tools, bespoke training to fill niches that VR gives you that emotional connection with 
so that they can actually do some brand awareness. They can connect with their customers better. They can train their employees better. And that's where you know, the startups and entrepreneurs, if they've got that skill set to create something around there, then you know, there are tools and things which make it a lot more cost effective. So you don't have to have a large capital to start that up. And companies, if you talk to them to start off with, are looking for uh, people to fill those gaps in their portfolio. Great. That's excellent. And I think that paints, you know, a little bit more context to the scene and what both enterprise and on the, the level of the creator side of what people can on an individual level, a small organizational level, create using these tools uh, to support uh, some sort of larger motive. Um, so moving away from enterprise and talking about the current climate of social good in AR and VR, mm. um, we, we all know that AR and VR can, you, can be used to inform new perspectives, to educate and make aware of issues that are happening around the globe. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, absolutely. We've, we've got a great initiative going at the moment with uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Lebecki. Uh, he's a National Geographic Explorer. And uh, what we did at Dell a few years back now is uh, we got him to do an expedition he took our, our rugged products with him. Uh, so it was actually to show rugged in hostile environments. But the, the key thing was that he was going to Greenland and it was to highlight the plight of the polar bear, right? So not all of us can get to Greenland. I'd love to go, but not gonna happen at this moment in time. Um, but how do we actually get people to see what the polar bears are going through, their environment, the harshness, but also to emotionally connect with a polar bear, which, you know, I'm not the press agent for polar bears, but, you know, people look at them as potentially ferocious beings, you know, they're, they're portrayed in nature programs and whatever, um, saw one the other day, but it's not that what we're trying to do. It's like plastic is now starting to appear in their diet. Plastic is now starting to appear uh, inside of polar bears themselves when they're discovered. And that's not a good thing. So how can we make people aware of the plight of what we're doing as human beings on this planet and what knock on effect that actually has in remote areas where we wouldn't actually go to to experience to be able to form that emotional bond. And when you see pieces like that, which was a 360 video, and then you see how graceful the polar bears are and you see the natural habitat, you really get that emotional connection there. And that was one piece we did. And we showed that at, uh, I think it was a South by Southwest that we did it at, uh, did a full talk there. And um, Sundance was another one we did with Mike actually there, a uh, great guy. And we've done some other pieces of work with him as well to uh, see indigenous tribes uh, where we go in there and we do 360 videos. So people can, again, can uh, really connect with the source material and really find out how they can actually help and make an impact, even though you're removed from it. Because I, I mentioned earlier, one of the things about VR <coughs> excuse me, is that you make an emotional connection. And with the, the view that you've got and the way that the information is presented, you really make that connection inside of there. And when you're going to these far-flung places, it really does feel like you're part of that environment. Uh, when you go to some of the location-based entertainment places where they actually lower the temperature of the room or wind comes through as well, it becomes even more immersive right inside of that. And so the emotional connection is a lot stronger. But even doing something like that at home and being able to see how we can improve as human beings, how we can do our own little piece, because you then see what the knock-on effect of that is. And... As one person, you think, oh, okay, I can't do a lot. But if everybody does their little piece and this piece helps bring everybody together to give them a common narrative and a common feeling across some of these things, then I think it's a great social change. That's fantastic. Which of these experiences that you're mentioning um, have had personally for you the most profound impact? What has been the most compelling use case that you've been able to uh, take in or witness? Wow, uh, I've, done, I've done so many that uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that in terms of the nature, then taking you to a different environment 
that you couldn't actually be in uh, is is one great way of doing it. I've also um, been involved in some pieces where uh, you get empathy with um, a, a different demographic, right? So that you can actually see challenges that people have that you don't consider right, being yourself. Right? And uh, it actually gives you an empathetic connection to other people, whether it be um, things like uh, or mental illness or whatever else inside of that, you can actually see what those people experience right inside of that because the visuals are changed to what that person will actually see. Um, there's bits about uh, experience of a heart attack and, or a stroke and knowing how to take those things in with sound and everything else that starts to change and you feel constriction. Uh, there's things about nature. We did a, a, a piece um, which was tree, right? and that showed you all the way from an acorn, well, not an acorn, a seed, all the way through into a huge tree, right? and you went through the growth process and saw the branches. Then there was a forest fire, and you, you heard all the sirens and the flames coming towards you. And meanwhile, inside of that experience, somebody's actually lighting a match and then giving you a waft of smoke underneath your, um, underneath your nose. So you're actually starting to get the smell and the texture of earth because there's a pot in front of you where you feel and it really does start to make you feel okay what about deforestation now does that really help to give you that connection and understand what's going on the answer is yes it does right so there's there's a whole raft of them out there and, and I, I don't think i could pick any particular one that blew me away more than anything else right and to bookend this conversation kind of about where this is used from this perspective and also from uh, an enterprise perspective, um, I feel like we're, we're, we also have to be considerate of the present. And while these solutions may sound exciting, we have a very real situation that we are looking to employ very real solutions to help us navigate. Um, so where, what is, where does AR and VR fit into the current climate from a entrepreneurial or startup perspective? Um, or even looking at a post-COVID-19 uh, time period? Oh, it's, I, I think it's coming with a, you know, well, it's definitely going to come. Um, VR has had several full starts uh, along the way, um, where it was then put, put on the shelf and then was brought out again occasionally, then put back on the shelf again. Uh, I don't think VR is going back on the shelf anytime soon. Uh, there were some naysayers where about 2017, 2018 timeframe, and it was, uh, there was a reduction in the number of headsets that went out year on year. Uh, that was primarily caused by the free headsets that were in newspapers and magazines and whatever that were being counted as real units that now weren't being shipped. And so there was a dip. Now we're actually seeing the numbers really surge again, and that's through people parting with hard-earned cash to actually buy VR headsets themselves. We're starting to see more developments in the higher end for higher end enterprise. Uh, there's a company out there that's actually doing combined VR and AR headset. Right? It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not your consumer level headset, it's purely built for enterprise. Uh, but that now allows you to see full 3D models and go between a VR and AR mode. So it takes the outside world, brings it in on the camera, overlays the graphics on top of that, and then merges it all together with lighting. So you're getting a very, very realistic view. Right? So now what we're having is VR and AR really starting to develop. And AR is probably, I would say, about 18 months behind VR. But that's going to become more and more acceptable. We've already seen that, as I mentioned earlier, with phone type devices. So people understand more about VR, uh, sorry, more about AR and what it can bring to the table. And when we start getting smaller, lighter headsets, when we start getting the advent of 5G, which will allow you the higher bandwidth, lower latency, to be able to connect with all these different endpoint devices when you're out and about, then you're going to start to have information literally at your eyeballs, right? Not just your fingertips, but your eyeballs now as well. And that is really going to change the face of how we interact with the world around us. Uh, hopefully, it's not going to get too noisy, right, with load of extraneous information that we don't need. But if we can have useful information presented, then I, I see it just as an upward trajectory. 
So, Gary, just as an additional, uh, I think the, the question that we might receive most often here and to, to put a, a end to this talk and moving forward into the future, um, to round it out, I know there's going to be some questions of where can I start right now? And you've gave some pointers to this, but to help put some context to it, how can someone bring this to their, themselves right now? Uh, what is the best place for them to begin? Oh, I'm tempted to say Dell.com forward slash VR. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> Perfect uh, answer. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we do have like other, other usages as well in, inside of that. Um, I mean, if you were starting off on VR, then just read around the subject. Uh, get a good handle for what's going on. I work in AR and VR 24-7. And to me, that doesn't even seem enough time to actually get a grasp on everything that's going on because it's such a huge area. It, it's fast developing and it's always changing. Uh, that's why I said earlier, you know, today is the first day of the rest of VR. It's, it's just going to go up from here on in. Um, make sure that you know, you've got a good grasp on what you're trying to do. Make sure you've got a, a business plan right, to say, OK, these are the areas I'm going to address because you can't address everything right, in one go. So what's going to be your area? What's going to be your niche? How, how is it going to service the company? How is it going to service the, uh, the clientele that you're going to present this to? And then, as I say, you can use tools to create your next opus, or you can learn to program from scratch, either of which are, are perfectly valid, depending on what the end result is you're trying to do. The, the strange thing about the question is that there is no right answer, because it really depends on the usage model. I've already uh, gone through several use cases across all different verticals, across all different types, all the way from uh, entertainment to healthcare, to design, to engineering, uh, to buildings, the whole works. The world is your oyster. You're only limited by your own imagination. Well, that's a great, great way to, to end this here. And thank you so much for sharing your insight with absolutely all of these different types of verticals. Um, I know that this is is such a an important topic right now and an exciting one too that's going to propel us forward. So Gary Radburn from Dell, thank you so much on behalf of Startup Nation, Dell, and Detroit Startup Week. We really appreciate you being here with us. Thank you. Enjoyed it.